Good afternoon. Thank you all for staying till the very last session. You're just so loyal. Thank you for being here. Well, so what we're going to talk about today is unraveling the mysteries of wireless connectivity and hearing aids. And I'm Carol Flexer, and I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Akron, retired from there in 2006, but still running around doing things. And Ron Levitt and I have been known each other for over 30 years. We were 10 when we met and, and have been doing research for about that long. Ron has an amazing private practice in Corvallis, Oregon, probably the best audiologist I know, who blends research and practice and has a consumer support group that he has had meeting monthly for the last 30 years. And in that consumer support group, they do a lot of product analysis. They do a lot of working with different technologies. So generates a lot of very fascinating information. And then we have Nikki Clark and Carrie Rector, who are audiology assistants who work with Ron, and both have been wearing hearing aids their entire lives, and have had lifelong experience with various technologies. So they can speak to these devices from both a consumer perspective and from a professional perspective, and they have a lot of insights to offer. So, here we go. Oh, want to mention that uh, we're not paid by any company. And we're going to start with our take on wireless connectivity. Anyone watch Fareed Zakaria, The Global Public Square? It's a great show. Anyway, he has a thing at the beginning where he has his take on what events are in the world. So this is our take about wireless connectivity. The first is without wireless connectivity and hearing aids, life is not so great for most hearing aid users. So I have to talk a bit about the brain, right? You're shocked that, of course, we hear with the brain, yeah, that the ears are the way in. They're the doorway, like the eyes are the doorway to the brain for visual perception. Ears are the doorway for auditory neural management and auditory perception. So looking at it that way, hearing loss is a doorway problem. And our job as audiologists is to breach that doorway and get as much auditory information to the brain as possible. That's what we do. So what devices do we need to use? How do we need to manage technology to make information in the world available to the brains of people who may have a doorway problem? So that's what we're going to be talking about. Our next take is that wireless connectivity addresses a number of problems that absolutely cannot be solved with even today's most advanced hearing aids. And third, even though wireless connectivity and hearing aids addresses many problems, it's not a panacea for all communicating issues experienced by people with hearing loss. So this is what we're going to weave into the talk today. Now before we look at the evidence, let's get a few housekeeping items out of the way. First things first, starting with a definition of wireless connectivity. What do we mean by that? What is it? Well, as it relates to hearing aid, wire aids, wireless connectivity refers to streaming acoustic signals from external microphones, telephones, sound systems, media devices without the use of hardwired cables. Now, you young people haven't really seen how we used to connect everything to hardwired cables. You probably remember being just locked into a device on a table with the wires to begin with. And that wasn't so long ago. I remember those even though I was very young when they had them. And, and then we had devices we wore, but we had all these wires connecting everything. So this whole idea of wireless to remote microphones, that, that's just an amazing development. 
So why does our definition need this much wireless access? Because research shows that multi-environmental listening utility, yeah, M-E-L-U, is highly correlated with hearing aid user satisfaction. Now, here's an overall summary of statistically significant relationships between outcome measures and different protocol items. And you can see that multiple environmental listening utility is a very important item. So what's out there in the way of wireless connectivity? Well, this is just a few of what's available from the big six hearing aid manufacturers, and this doesn't include third-party devices. This is just a sampling of what's available, and there's new stuff coming on the market all the time. So let's look at the evidence. Now remember the statement, without wireless connectivity and hearing it, connectivity and hearing aids, life isn't really great for most hearing aid users. Now, here is a consumer data on consumer satisfaction on overall sound quality, performance noise, one-on-one -on -one situations comparing looking at hearing aids and direct mail hearing aids. But the, the thing to look at is that hearing aid user satisfaction rate in noisy places is about 36%. So we are, this is like not news. We know that people who wear hearing aids have a lot of trouble in noise. That's not news. But the issue is understanding why and then what can we actually do about it. Because we can do some stuff about it. Now, satisfaction rates among listening experiences, here's some more information, data and meetings, lectures, church service on the telephone, are also unacceptably low. So what's the basis of these problems, of, of hearing and noise, of these, these stressful situations? Why are they a problem? Well, let's start with listening in noisy places and lecture-type situations. There are three major acoustical reasons for these problems, right? Inverse square law, signal-to-noise ratio, and signal degradation consideration. So there's a physics behind what's going on with listening difficulties. So let's start with the first two. Inverse square law and signal-to-noise ratio. Well, we know that the inverse square law means that with every doubling of distance, there's a decrease in 6 dB. Now, you have to think about what this means. It means that, clearly, the further one is from the sound source, the less clear the signal will be. But it's less clear for multiple reasons. That less clarity often involves a frequency domain. But when you're in a noisy environment, the noise is there no matter where the speaker is. Now, it could be there are pots of noise sources in various parts of the room. But in many times, the noise is just everywhere. We were just in a restaurant, and there was just noise everywhere. It doesn't matter where you're sitting. It's noisy. So when the listener moves away from the sound source, the desired sound source, that sound source they're listening to, that talker, gets less and less clear, but the noise is always there. And in addition, this is still the same conversation, not only do we have noise everywhere, but we also have reverberation or echo. And so you have the desired signal. And by, you know, when I talk about signal, I really mean information, right? Because what we're getting to the brain is not beep, 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 shh. It's knowledge, information. So when we have a degradation of information, what the person is missing is knowledge. 
is what's going on around. It, that's a very important thing. So we as audiologists have to get that it's our job to get through that doorway into the brain with information so that the person has knowledge of their environment, knowledge of the conversations, and of what's going on around them in order to make decisions about their behavior and about actions. So with reverberation, we get overlap masking of the desired information because not everyone is in the direct field, not everyone gets direct information. For many, it's bouncing all around, and what they're getting is, is an echo, is a masking, an overlap masking of the information that they want to have. And there's so many sources that document these issues. Now, signal degradation also, of course, has a frequency component, right? Because looking at, and I love the count the dots audiogram, and when you have audiograms with speech sounds on it, we know they're not really precise, but it gives us an indication of the frequency and intensity about where these sounds are, most of their speech energy occurs, different format and frequencies. But as we notice that speech, in terms of intelligibility, is high frequency dominant. And what that means is that 90% of the intelligibility of speech is carried in the high frequencies, but only 10% of the power. Conversely, 90% of the energy, I'm talking about English, is carried in the low frequencies, but only 10% of the intelligibility. So for intelligibility, we have to really make sure, well, all phonemes, of course, but particularly the high frequency phonemes because they carry 90% of the meaning of the information that the person is trying to obtain. Now, the other problem in signal degradation related to this frequency conversation is wavelength, right? Low frequencies have a long wavelength and high frequencies have short little wavelengths. The problem with these short little wavelengths is they're fragile. They, they get deflected, they get absorbed. They're, they're not robust, but guess what goes around and through and under and is the low frequencies, the power sounds but they don't carry a lot of the intelligibility. So when you're in a noisy environment, reverberant environment, it's those high frequencies that are particularly vulnerable, which removes a lot of information from the brain of the person who wants that information. Now, Ron and I did our, the RAS, a RASTI study in 1991. Again, we were about 10. And in that study, we were looking at signal degradation across a classroom. And as it's, it's a little small, but the point is, even in the front row center seat, the RASTI score rapid speech transmission index was 0.83, which, which means that's all the information that got, even just got to that front seat. And by the back seat, the RASTI scores were about 0.5, which means half of the information in the acoustic signal didn't even get to the back of the room. Now, if you have a fully programmed auditory neural system with a great database of information, you don't need any more than that to be able to fill in the gaps, right? You're going to have to work hard, and you might not enjoy it but you can fill it in. But don't we hope, especially in school, that from time to time there's new information? Information that's not already in the brain. And therefore, if the entire bit of that knowledge doesn't get to the brain, then the brain doesn't have what to program. So the more intact the signal, the more information the brain has to work with. So what about telephone listening? Remember, all these hearing aid users say they're getting an average of 57% handicap reduction using their hearing aid on the phone. That's not so good. In other words, they're not doing really well on the phone. So our next statement is that wireless connectivity addresses a number of problems that can't be solved by even the most advanced hearing aids. So let's start with communication improvements associated with remote microphones and wireless transmitters. 
For ease of use, we prefer a single device that can do everything. And now Nikki and Carrie will talk about some of these different devices and why some pros and cons of their effectiveness. So I've had a hearing loss since uh, I was born. I was first fit with a hearing aid when I was five years old. So I've grown up with wearing big hearing aids, having the fanny pack around my waist in school to use the FM system. So I've grown up with that. I don't want that anymore. I want something small, discreet, something that's not so noticeable, not drawing attention to me, unnecessary attention. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of these devices. Uh, they're the first device that I'm going to talk about. Um, this one is a remote mic, and it also uh, works with the iPhone or the Android phone and streams the phone call directly to your hearing aid. You can also uh, clip it onto somebody and it streams their voice directly to the hearing aid. Um, you can also uh, um, do three microphones at the same time, which is something that I have been really looking forward to being able to do. You can put three microphones on everybody, on three people, and have them simultaneously work at the same time. Some of the issues that we've had with this is that it becomes easily unpaired, and it's not easy to pair them back up. Um, and also, you have to have the little boot on to the hearing aid, which makes the hearing aid bigger, which I don't really enjoy. Or if you don't want to do the boot, you can do uh, the thing around the neck, um, which I'm not a big fan of. Um, the next one over here uh, is a remote, a um, phone uh, streamer, and a microphone. This device is um, a little bigger than what I would like. It's about a uh, size of a flip phone. So if you're going to have someone wear this device as a microphone, it's really heavy and it weighs on the clothing, um, which is something that a lot of people are not going to want to wear. Um, and it doesn't work as well setting it on the table because you're picking up the knives, the silverware, the glasses that are being banged down on the floor. Um, one more thing about this device over here is if it's dropped, it will actually shut off. That way then it doesn't, you don't hear the banging on the floor, which is really nice. I've had other remote microphones that if they're dropped, you hear the banging on the floor. So and that's, that's, that's certainly a useful feature on that because the clip's not very strong. Every time I'd stand up, it would yeah. fall on the floor. So we tested it out the very first time I put it on. <laughs> Um, and then Carrie's going to move on over to this other remote mic. While she's getting ready, I should give a shout out to Douglas Beck from Oticon. He was doing a presentation somewhere and we went there and he actually wore that thing around. I was, I was very impressed that he did, but I was worried that the weight of it was going to make it come crashing down, but it didn't, so yay. <laughs> Alright, the next device is a smaller device and it's easy to clip onto somebody else. You can also put it on the middle of the table and can pick up two to three voices and stream directly into your hearing aid. You don't have to wear anything around your neck and that's really nice. It can go up to 20 feet without any static sound. I noticed that the other uh, two remote mic, I noticed the static sound, it wasn't that great sound quality for me. It was hard for me to follow a conversation with somebody else. And, um, and it's easy to pair, so I noticed that when, when you push the button, you open and close your hearing aid, a battery door, and you hear that dun dun dun, and you know you're paired up to that remote and it's really nice and it's easy to use. And they also came out with a newer um, remote mic that has a T-coil built into that device. And you don't have to have that T-coil built into your hearing aid. And so any place that has that loop system, you can pair it and you don't have to clip that remote onto somebody else. Because it can be a hassle to walk up to the front of the room and be like, can you wear this please? And so it's kind of, bringing attention when you don't want that attention. So let's talk a little bit about how a remote microphone changes aided speech audibility, aided SII, speech intelligibility index. 
Here is, a, that's not a beard by the way, it was really cold that morning, I was wearing a <laughs> scarf. Uh, it sort of looks like I'm trying to join ZZ Top or something, <laughs> but uh, that's the only picture I had of it, so we had to go with it. Uh, what I did is I took a remote mic and placed it six inches away from the loudspeaker, and then you can see I'm measuring five feet from the loudspeaker of our real ear system to the microphone of Nikki's hearing aid. And what I did was I ran a real ear aided response at a 65 dB SPL input using the carrot passage under both conditions. The bottom one you can see I hit target for the most part for that mild hearing loss uh, with the microphone of the hearing aid five feet away. But, yes, yeah, she wants me to use the pointer, okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> hearing loss here, for those of you that aren't used to reading these audiograms upside down, to stand on your head and it'll be just right. Uh, unaided hearing, target at 65 dB input, and uh, long-term average speech spectrum obtained on the dark green and then you see what happens when you move the remote microphone within six inches of the loudspeaker you get approximately a 20 dB increase in audibility across the board and while that doesn't make a big difference to a person with a mild loss like this it can make a tremendous difference to someone who has more hearing loss. Now, Ryan McCreary and his group at Boys Town Institute have a software program you can add to the audio scan verifit system that will compute, will estimate how much benefit you'll get at various distances. So it will theoretically compute these values. But what I said to him is in our measurements for actual hearing aid use, and this is now Nikki's true hearing loss on her right ear, and here you see the aided SII for a 65 dB input with the distance of five feet away from the hearing aid microphone and the top one is the long-term average speech spectrum line I'm tracing here when the microphone was six inches away and you can see that now we're only getting about 10 dB at every audiometric frequency. Why do you think that is? The gentleman in the great coat that I've envied every day. Why do you think this one doesn't work as well? Why is it for more powerful hearing aids, you cannot realize that 20 dB across every frequency? You don't have the headroom, exactly. So these theoretical ideas of how much you can get have to be tempered by your reality, but it's easily testable empirically, and I would argue that's a better way to do it. And to their credit, the people that made this external mic really didn't change the frequency response of that hearing aid when it was working on its external microphone setting. That's something that we didn't have in the past. Those of you who remember ancient studies on telecoil sensitivity, they never looked like the microphone response. So here we have a pretty nice parallel line between the two. So this is the good news about that. And you can see that again, yes, we only got 10 dB of gain across each audiometric frequency, but wow, 10 dB for single syllable words, PI, PB function 3% per monosyllabic word. That's 30% jump right there in monosyllabic syllabic words and even greater for sentence tests. So this is all the good news about use of the external microphone and increased audibility. So to put it all together for you, when the microphone is closer to the talker, not only are speech cues more audible, but the signal noise ratio is improved. As, you, as Carol pointed out, as we go over distance, the signal of interest is dying off, but the noise not so much. And boy, you could really hear it at that lovely Italian restaurant where we had lunch. That uh, waterfall and all the hoo that was going on, we couldn't find a place in there where there wasn't pretty much a consistent level of noise. But the further we got from each other, the poorer the signal got. So the signal noise ratio is constantly degrading rather rapidly over distance. You can see we start out at plus 15 and all you have to do is go six feet and you've got a plus nine, which for a lot of hearing aid wearers really isn't enough signal noise ratio. And the inverse square problem is largely overcome. And 
the disproportionate degradation of high frequency information so critical to speech intelligibility is minimized. By the way, one thing I should say about this study, the only place where we got 100% accurate reproduction of the rapid sound transmission signal was at six inches. Only there was there 100% integrity of that amplitude frequency modulated signal. So even front row center, you know, we like preferential seating in school, well we're throwing away 17% of the integrity of the signal when we do that. And as the signal gets further away, reverberation has more chance to do its ugly thing. And going back even into the 60s, we knew that reverberation was a disproportionate problem for people who had hearing loss and hearing aids. But we said wireless connectivity is going to answer a number of these questions. What about the telephone use problem? Remember, only 57% of the reduction in skill, reduction in intelligibility uh, was being achieved with today's technology. Not an ideal situation. So let's take a look at what happened with Carrie here as I perform this quick experiment. She's unfortunate because she's in the same room with me every day, so anytime I get wondering about something, she's right there and we can do this. So what I did is we had uh, the AZ bio sentences and we had amplitude compressed cafeteria noise and we had a landline phone so I went into one of our other rooms and called her on the landline phone and with a sound level meter adjusted at the mouthpiece of the telephone the AZ bio sentences to 65 dB SPL and the background noise 5 dB less and then just played the sentences and come to find out these wireless devices for telephone are not all created equal. Imagine if you would that for example we only worked with one brand of hearing aids. These are five different manufacturers hearing aids and their telephone interface device. Imagine that we only had one brand and we put her in product number two where she was scoring 18% correct. She wouldn't be able to function on the phone because that's just not enough information to really be functional. And in fact, uh, a little face validity to this, she wasn't able to talk on the phone until we finally found uh, systems three and five. So it's not just theoretically she couldn't talk on the phone. In reality, she couldn't talk on the phone for 28 years, essentially. So they're not all created equal. Number three and number five do better. So it raises the question, why does she do so well with those? What, what is it about those that are so superior? Oh, and by the way, this, I, I just realized this uh, while we were talking of practicing before we came in here. If you were to average all of those, it comes out probably, I didn't really do it, to somewhere around 50% handicap reduction, which is interesting. What, interestingly what people reported was about their ability to communicate on the telephone in that previous survey of 2003. 332 hearing aid wearers, so it gives a little uh, boost to that uh, self-report of problems. So, getting back to my question, why is it she does so well with some and so poorly with others? Well, it's not just her that's doing poorly. I have a lot of friends who have hearing aids, and I have 30 people that do product testing for us in this group. And they call me oftentimes when they have their telephone intermediary devices on. And come to find out, when they call me from their car, I can't understand them with some of the different devices. And so what I did is I thought, well, I'm probably not unique in this. I, I have a recording studio, and I'm, I'm a sound engineer. So I, I got to thinking, why don't I call some of my colleagues in the professional recording business and have them listen to this exact same AZ bio list and the same signal noise ratio, same technique, and have them just give a letter grade to the sound quality. And you'll see not only does Carrie do dramatically differently, but their ratings of sound quality were dramatically different between these systems. 
ranging from nah, it's a C, C plus, to one that was so terrible they said, please, just turn it off, I've heard enough, to one that they said, you know, this I can live with. So, now, that brings up the question, why did Kerry do so well? It has to do with this, one of the unpleasant laws of physics. If you've ever taken your driver's license and set it on a copy machine and made a copy of it and looked what came out of the copy machine, it doesn't look so good anymore. But then if you take that picture and lay it on top of the copy machine and make another copy, what comes out doesn't look like anything. A copy of a copy is degrading the information. Every time you compress and reassemble data, something is lost. Well, imagine then you have an intermediary telephone device. The cell phone itself uses Bluetooth transmission. It has to compress that signal. It has to do that frequency hopping thing. and and it has very limited distance transmission and it's somewhat uh, affected by other 2.5 gig devices in the room. So you have introduced distortion to the signal. You've at least ampli amplitude and frequency compressed it before it was transmitted from the phone. Then it's received by the intermediary device. Then it's transduced again into the hearing aid. A copy of the copy. By contrast, what if you could go directly from your phone, losing the intermediary device, right to the hearing aid? Now you've only got one copy. So by the physics of the situation, you would expect it would sound better for everybody involved. And son of a gun, it does. So let's try to lose the intermediary devices. They're one more thing to go wrong, one more thing to care for, and they're degrading the signal somewhat. Let's go directly from the phone to the hearing aid. Now people say to me, but, but these are only developed for iPhone. Right now that's true. But wow, you know, you haven't been able to use hearing aid uh, telephone for 28 years. Let's just get an iPhone and be done with it. And believe me, I get nothing from Apple. I don't, e I don't even use one. I've got an Android. But, <laughs> but still, if you want to really hear on the phone, get an iPhone and do that direct transmission. Get that thing out of the middle. Yes, they're expensive. Yes, they, the cables are expensive. Yes, I mean, there's a whole... I, and I don't know how to use one. I always have to sort of rely on these two who have iPhones. But... <laughs> Um, this is the way you're going to be able to, you know, if you can go from 18% word recognition with a corner audiogram and no hearing, in the, hardly any hearing in the other ear, to 83%, probably a good idea. And that's why losing the intermediary device gives better sound quality. Furthermore, this arrangement allows carry to constantly vary the signal to noise ratio to her liking. We were at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but there's like 178,000 people in 20 rooms and they're all cement. Cement floor, cement walls, cement ceiling, and everybody's yelling and there's rock bands playing and interviews going on. <clears throat> noise level is probably somewhere in the 95 dBA level everywhere you go. Carrie gets a phone call, tells her hearing aid microphones, go dead, give me only the phone. And there she was talking to normal hearing people on the other end. But they said, whoa, I can't hear you in all this noise. Call me back later. So here's a turn of the tables, a deaf person talking on the phone. And then I wanted to make a restaurant reservation because 178,000 people in one hotel, you can imagine it's kind of hard to get in to eat. I said, I'll call and make a reservation. I couldn't hear a thing. So Nikki says, no problem, give it to me. Streamed it to her hearing aid. So, wow. Um, that's the possibility offered here. Now, you might say, but I don't want the microphones totally dead. Well, you've got constantly variable gain on the hearing aid microphone, so you choose the signal noise ratio. So if you're in a noisy place, but you want to hear what the person next to you is saying, you can decide, give me a little more gain on this ear. So, this is a, a, a new era of wireless connectivity whereby deaf people do better than hearing people on the phone in noisy places. But 
you might say, what about today's most advanced hearing aids solving these listening problems without a remote microphone? Haven't you ever heard of beam forming technology? Studies say that it gives better speech understanding and noise for people with hearing loss and hearing aids than people with normal hearing. But the laws of physics still apply. If you're at a distance, you're still going to have to deal with degradation of signal to noise ratio. You're going to have to deal with the degradation of the integrity of the signal. And the hearing aid cannot recreate it once it's gone. You know, it can't say, well, I'm looking for all the S's that were lost in that sentence, so I'm just going to randomly stick them in here where they belong. That, that doesn't happen. And reverberation is still a problem. And so those laws of physics are not suggestions. They are the laws of physics because it always happens. So beamforming might work well in the near field, but it's not going to work well 12, 15, 18, 21 feet away. And today's beamforming hearing aids have a problem that I don't hear discussed very often. And it came from this report by Yu Sang Wu and his colleagues uh, Stangle and Bentler at University of Iowa. And they were expecting to see some really good results from these beamforming hearing aids because they had heard demonstrations, they'd listened under earphones at various conferences and expected wonderful things. So what they did is they got speakers from a variety of directions feeding noise into uh, the hearing aid and then they had a target speaker that had a sentence that the user had to repeat. But come to find out, and they were, they were terribly concerned about this, in the first run of this without a carrier phrase where it was just the target sentence and it had to be repeated, the omnidirectional hearing aids and the beam formers did about the same in noise. They couldn't figure out why can, how can this be? So they decided, let's introduce a carrier phrase. I did this in a similar study after I heard about it. Uh, so they said something like, the next sentence will come from this loudspeaker and then it came out. Well, all of a sudden, now the beamformers really look better than the directional, uh, than the omnidirectional microphone. So yay, that's how they're supposed to work. But it needed a carrier phrase. Because there's an unpleasant little, eh, unpleasant, there is a, I don't even want to say necessary, there's a delay between the time the beamformer figures out who is the primary speaker and the time that it shifts to that speaker, wherever it may shift. So Dr. Wu drew this uh, uh, graphic here to show if you're having a conversation back and forth, they don't work too well because your own voice is actually changing the beamformer as you're talking. And then when somebody talks, you, it's not there until it figures out, oh, I need to go back here. So where they work their best is in a monologue down here at the bottom where one person's talking all the time and you never say anything back. I have friends like that and patients sometimes call me on the phone who are much like that. But under near field conditions, near field conditions, you know, six feet or so, they work pretty well. In fact, looking here at a 5.1 surround system, uh, you can see that with Carrie and Nikki's beloved hearing aids that they wear all the time and I never seem to be able to pry off their ears to try anything else, uh, Carrie was able to score 32% in this noisy situation and Nikki 54%. By contrast, when they put on the beamformer, Carrie almost tripled her score. Nikki almost doubled her score in terms of speech intelligibility on those AZ bio sentences and noise. So you might be thinking they must really be loving these hearing aids. So talk to them about how much you do. 
Well, with the training, they really do work, and I can follow a conversation in a very noisy situation, but you're taking away those environmental sounds around me, so it's making me feel more deaf than I really am. So I don't want you guys taking away those environmental sounds, but I can control it myself with those remote mic, not the beam forming hearing aids. And uh, I was at a restaurant and uh, talking with Ron, and it worked really well. I could hear him uh, a lot more clear. I didn't have all the background noise. It was great. But as soon as I started talking, um, and we would go back and forth talking, uh, it would beam to my mouth. And then three words later, it would go back to Ron when he would reply. So I'm missing those two to three words uh, by the time it figures out, oh, we need to go back over here. So that's the delay that Dr. Levitt was talking about um, and if someone were to come up behind me or if there was a, a, a crash of dishes back there or something I would not hear that um, and I would rather have the control to choose which direction things are going. I like to be able to control with uh, using a remote mic where I can turn down the gain here and only use listen to the remote mic. Otherwise, it's just taking, it'd be like painting a picture on a moving canvas. Uh, it's very confusing having all that changing going on with the hearing aids. And I thought, we looked at six other people, I thought that it would at least be uh, exciting to some, and it was in fact to one. He said, yeah, this, is, this really works for me. But I can understand Carrie's point particularly. She said, you know, I've been deaf all my life. My, my world has been within six feet of me, and now you finally give me a hearing aid where I can hear, and now you want to take it all away and put me back into a tube or a bubble, I think she called it, uh, especially with just your voice, that is all I can hear, she didn't see that as such a, a good option. So, I think we can conclude that a remote mic is still going to be needed, even with the improvements in microphone directionality and hearing aids. So now let's get to statement three. Even though wireless connectivity and hearing aids addresses many problems, it's not a cure, not a panacea for all the listening communication problems experienced by hearing aid wearers. Unfortunately, today's sophisticated hearing aids can't make up for lost real ear aided audibility. And by the way, Every time I see somebody use our slide, they do it better than us. Now this slide was by Gus Mueller, and I, and I thought, boy, this is really great, because this didn't appear in our original article. But uh, I gotta give Gus credit for this. But today I saw one from Washington University Medical School where they'd even had uh, the improvement. As, well, it was, it was a lovely slide, and we'll get those <laughs> next time. But anyway, <laughs> uh, here's what we did. We found uh, six premium level hearing aids from the big six manufacturers and we used manufacturers best fit on our subjects and what we discovered was that Oh, words, remember? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, what we discovered was that if you took a 20 year old hearing aid that was omnidirectional and you programmed it exactly to an NAL target and had people do the quick speech and noise test, which is a test where they vary signal to noise ratio in 5 dB steps and kind of look at the point where you break down. So in this test, the shorter the bar, the better your score because that means the speech, the noise that you didn't want to hear could get really close to the speech you were trying to hear. So the long bars are bad scores, meaning the noise had to be dramatically below the speech you were trying to hear. And the short bars means that the noise and the speech were almost on top of each other. So the shorter the better. So you can see, weirdly, the 20 year old omnidirectional analog hearing aid with no noise reduction features whatsoever got the best score over these premium hearing aids when you used manufacturer's best fit for these subjects as measured by the quick speech and noise test presented at 65 dB sound pressure level in uh, sound field. 
But I reasoned that really hearing aids have improved more. There's, there's got to be some benefit if we were to reprogram them to in fact an NAL target and take out all the dents in audibility. Because in our article we showed just how far off target these manufacturers best fit were. And what we discovered is son of a gun, every one of those hearing aids started performing better once they were programmed, guided by real ear. Giving more audibility gave more word recognition. Now, I'll give a, one little warning to all of you. Just because you do this for people doesn't mean they're going to love it. In fact, um, and I'll say this twice because it's, it's not, I don't think, a particularly popular view in this profession, but I don't think we're well served asking people, do you like the sound of this? Because uh, today, a Vanderbilt uh, study by Aaron Piku and her colleagues showed that in fact, the less high frequency sound you give to people, the more pleasant they find the sound. Well, I'm not surprised by that. They've been not hearing high frequencies for 20 years. So if you put them all back at once, it's kind of teeth jarring to them. So the user perception of sound quality would not be good if you did this all at once for people, particularly for new users. So and, but that argues, why, by the way, why we always look at the real ear data on people who already have hearing aids because it kind of shows us a starting point. If they're already at a full NAL target or DSL IO, I'm not really mar married to any of them. As long as they have good audibility from some real ear measure without odd drops in aided SII in certain frequency ranges, I'm good with that. Uh, I got nothing to... Uh, no axe to grind with either of those procedures. But the point is, audibility gives speech understanding in noise. It doesn't necessarily give uh, high ratings for sound quality. And so, in conclusion, at that point, today's sophisticated hearing aids can't make up for lost real ear aided audibility by wireless features alone. And, sadly, this is our poster session tomorrow, based on 75 hearing aid wearers and 130 some odd hearing aids, people came into our clinics with these hearing aids already. So we were interested in what kind of programs they had in them on their default setting. So what we did is we just got our videotoscope out and made sure that there was no corrosion on the microphone or the receivers. We looked to see they were functioning as they should and we ran real ear measures on their hearing aids. And if they can formed exactly to an NAL and L2 target, all the red and blue lines here would be running straight across at zero. That means no air from the NAL and L2 target. And again, I don't, you know, I'm not married to NAL and L2. If you like DSL IO, fine. If, but my point is, the odd thing is they have progressive presbycusic slope high frequency hearing losses, yet the fittings are becoming progressively poorer as you go into the high frequencies on the magnitude of, on average, 17 dB in both right and left ears for these mini hearing aid fittings. So you're seeing something of a trend here. And in fact, only 14% of them met the McCreary criteria of being within 5 dB of target. So so those studies, we did one of them, uh, Mueller and Picou did one of them, that show about 30% of hearing aids are being programmed using real ear data. Our numbers here, looking kind of through the back door to see where they were rather than what people said they were using, suggests that maybe that number is closer to 14% are using real ear data. And here's the problem that affects wireless connectivity. When the default program is wrong, the wireless program is wrong. When there is insufficient audibility in the default program, there will be insufficient audibility in the wireless program, unless for some reason, and this would be kind of odd, they would go into the wireless program alone and reprogram it to a higher level of gain than they did the default program. And I would argue that that probably doesn't happen a whole lot, not, not very likely. 
thereby reducing the benefit of wireless connectivity in noisy places, in conferences, and on the telephone. We're subtracting this opportunity they have. And it's not occurring only in Oregon. Here's another one of those 30% error studies. And Consumer Reports, back in 2009, you may recall, said 67% of those hearing aids were not properly programmed to their 48 hearing aids, 12 people uh, tests that they did. And Ryan McCreary said 28% of his subjects, 199 school-aged children with hearing aids, had at least one ear that deviated from prescriptive targets by more than 5 dB RMS and average. So, I think we can conclude that even though wireless connectivity and hearing aids offers great potential for improved listening and communication, poor hearing aid programming can greatly reduce that potential benefit. In addition, there's a whole bunch of other factors that we can't control. So my, my position is this. Let's do the things we can do. We can give back audibility. We can open the doorway, as Carol said, to the brain to a greater extent, feeding more auditory information in there. We can't control some of these other factors, such as auditory processing deficits, phonemic regression, disproportionately poor word recognition scores than you would expect based on the hearing loss, reduced language competency, poor use of technology, and compromised cognition. And I, I left one thing out on purpose, but I think I want to say it too. I think sometimes manufacturer advertising creates unrealistic expectations for performance. And we have to overcome that. We have to, it's hard to, to undo that when there's so much of it and it's so visible in so many forms of media. So that is the crux of the things we can't solve, the things we can do is make sure we've got good audibility and train people appropriately in this use. To quote Robin Cox, she said, we need to move away from technology-driven profession and start thinking about uh, uh, what David Lilly calls a high-touch profession, meaning not high-tech but high-touch. We have to start being able to train people in these devices and make sure we do our best to allow them audibility. So with that, uh, we agreed we are all going to have our last word on all of this data. Uh, let's start with you, Carol. Oh, well, I just uh, have to go back to the brain that to get that in order for the person to best use their cognitive capacity and not to drain away their um, energy that they want to use for learning or communicating, that we need to get the clearest, highest fidelity information to their brain in as many situations as possible so the person has an opportunity for gaining knowledge and for communicating. Carrie, what about you? What's your final thoughts? Um, I think that be educating your patient and listening to them about what they want, just don't assume what hearing aid is best for them because there are devices out there that are smaller and I was always told that a smaller hearing aid or a smaller device would never work for me and so I was told wrong and that makes me as a hearing aid wear frustrated and so just make sure you listen to your patient and people with a hearing loss. Um, educating the patients on remote microphones and also providing a remote microphone to the patient uh, is a really useful tool in the noisy environments. Um, and I, I use it in the car, I, especially when I have someone in the back seat. It's really helpful uh, and less distracting of trying to turn around and go, what? Um, so I think a remote microphone is a really useful tool that you can provide to the patient. And also, like Carrie said, find products that don't draw attention because we don't like it. And I said it earlier, I'll say it one more time, I think using as our major criteria for success, user perception of sound quality will run you into problems because it's certainly in the early phases. Hearing aid wearers, and there's some data now supporting this from Vanderbilt, are going to like less high frequency information. Unfortunately, they won't understand speech better with that, so you have to strike a compromise between keeping the person 
person sufficiently uh, happy to continue the process and doing what you believe is going to give them better word recognition because we need to open the doorway to the greatest extent we can. The question was, uh, yes, it's nice to hit target, uh, but what about those patients who come back the next day and say, I'm sorry, but this is just too much. Uh, I, I agree with you completely. We see that too. And that's why we always look at, if they come in with hearing aids, they're experienced hearing aid words, we look to see where they are. And it is greatly difficult to move a person who's worn a dramatically underfit hearing aid up to a target. Dramatically hard. Uh, this has been an issue not only in audiology but in professional audio. When Edgar Vilcher built the first acoustic research loudspeakers, they had a much better high frequency response than any other loudspeaker there was. So uh, he took his old scratchy records and laid them down and put the needle on and it was and his wife said, if you don't get that out of this house, I'm going to hit it with a hammer. So what he did is he took capacitors, 10 of them, and put them across the junction of the terminals in the back of the loudspeaker, rolling off the high frequencies. And each week, he pulled off one. So it went from, you know, he had a little lamb to a little more high frequency, but not just a tiny bit. And then the next week, he pulled off one more. So long story short, after 10 weeks, she was back to but she'd kind of gotten used to it. <clears throat> Carrie did the same thing. She's had a dead ear for 29 years on the left side, so I said, I know what let's do. And you're going to really wonder about me. Let's get a cochlear implant on that ear. This never hurt anything. Well, for the first two months, <laughs> we're in a room that's maybe this, the length of this table together every day for 10 hours. And we walked around each other very gingerly because, first of all, she hated my S's. She had never heard one. So, you know, you have a very bad S, she said. <laughs> uh, and I really don't like this thing and really didn't much like me either. So now it's been nine months, 10 months. A number of months, we're back to talking to each other, and that's good. But what you're saying is really true. They're not going to like, and you can't do it. You can't just go from this uh, fitting we showed you back here where we were. Yeah, there you go. You can't go from this fitting here shown in red and blue to a zero fitting. That Nobody will tolerate that. Uh, I, I've never, uh, never say never. I can't recall an instance where anyone's ever tolerated that. We sort of work them up like Edgar Vilch did with his wife and his acoustic research loudspeakers. Uh, no, it's not. Um, we tried all the different manufacturers' remote microphones. We've tried more than just the three that we talked about. Just those were the top three that we decided to talk on. Um, but it really wasn't. Um, I, I just like the sound quality uh, of uh, the remote mics on, on the far right. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing is, like I said, cosmetic concerns, you know, they're not trying to hide the fact that they're hearing impaired, no. okay? I mean, they're, they're way past that. But why pay an unnecessary con cosmetic penalty? Carrie came to me with a hearing aid that long that wasn't as powerful as the one she's wearing now that's that long and that wide. And uh, she had a thing around her neck that she had been, it was an, an, an anathema to her. She had worn them in her preschool, uh, grade school, and middle school years. She didn't want to go back to it. She didn't care who made it, uh, and I don't think they care about one manufacturer. In fact, she has a suitcase full of everything, and I've, try, I've tried to get her to try other things, and from time she'll take them out and show people, you know, this is this, is this and this, but uh, I, I'm not able to get her to wear them. And I'm not tied to any manufacturer. If tomorrow uh, Phonak or Starkey or Siemens, whatever, came out with a uh, uh, even smaller remote mic, I would try them out and I would probably like it and prefer it. Um, uh, no matter what manufacturer I use, as long as uh, it gives me good audibility and um, has a remote microphone system, that's what I'll use. Yeah, we sign no agreements with any manufacturers. We don't care about any of them, truly, don't care. <laughs> Uh, 
they have a visor clip for their car so they can be hands free and you know it's close enough and Carrie's done some experimenting with just how far she can get away from that phone and still have good audibility on the other end. You want to say anything about that? Um, I can just pretty much have it in front of me like just this distance um, on top of the divider in, in my car um, but I noticed that if you like are getting ready in the morning right now you just put it on the dresser and you walk away and do something else you have to remember they can't hear you but you can hear them so you just have to remind yourself you're like oh yeah and I have a really noisy sports car so uh, people on the other end haven't had any trouble with me putting my phone up in the visor or even in my lap. I've actually held it in my lap right here and been able to drive and it's noisy in my car and they can hear me just fine. I prefer having what I have uh, just because I'm not having to wear something on me. And it is hands-free because uh, this is in the visor. I don't have to touch it if I don't want to. Um, uh, I don't have to hold it up here. It's just as long as it's either in the visor or on my lap, that's fine. She also puts in her hood sometimes. She forgot to mention that. She'll hang it in her hood when she's wearing one. Yeah, I've done that before too. <laughs>